What is a motivation for being holy? Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Many times you come to see that you're walking in a place you shouldn't be walking or living in a way you shouldn't be living. And immediately, condemnation comes upon you. And that condemnation drives you farther away from, from Christ. You feel ashamed. You feel like it's, it's a works idea of, well, I've got to you know, get my life fixed, do this and everything, and then kind of earn some brownie points and then come back. And we have so much old covenant teaching and do not realize about the new covenant. Some things that are so beautiful. Christ really did pay it all. He really did pay it all. And when you come to the realization the Holy Spirit has convicted you in your heart that you're wrong, you should not be listening then to the devil who begins condemnation and everything else and tries to drive you further and further away from the Savior. When the Lord tells you you're wrong, He says also, He says it like this, He goes, you're wrong. I love you. Come back. You're wrong. You are without spot before me. Come back. I love you. You want to know what happens when a believer sins? God continues to love them. God continues to woo them. God continues to come after them. God continues to draw them. Let me give you an example. Let's say that God wants me to fast, pray, and read the Word all morning. But I want to go out to my wood shop and work. According to many fundamentalist pastors, this is what's going to happen. God's going to stand there and say, well, you just go ahead and go to your workshop if you want, but I'm not going with you. And by the way, I hope you cut your fingers off. You know what really happens? I'll tell you what happens. I go out to that workshop. God is screaming at me. I love you, Paul. I love you. Nothing will change that. Come away with me. I'm looking for a board. He goes over there with me and helps me find it. I said, Paul, here's the board. But I love you. Come away with me. I turn on that power saw. He guards my fingers. And when I look across that saw at the other side of it, he's standing there going, Paul, I love you. I love you. I love you. Come back with me. A bruised reed, he will not break. And a burning wick, he will not put out. What does that mean? It means this, my dear friend. Well, you go down to Israel, and, and there the children would cut cane. There's just thousands and millions of cane growing everywhere. And they would cut cane, and they would, they would make a flute out of it. But as they were making the flute with the cane, the, the flute would sometimes just break because cane is very fragile. Well, they wouldn't try to fix the flute. They'd throw it away and get another piece of cane. There's all kinds of cane where that one came from. No sense working with that. Just throw it away and start all over again. That's not the way God works. God, God selects a piece of cane, begins to work with it, play beautiful music from this thing. And then for the fractures and the failure and the cane itself, it breaks. But God doesn't take that broken believer and throw him out and say, well, I can you know, get someone else. i got plenty where this guy came from. He'll take it and he'll mend it again. Mend it again. And mend it again. How many times have I broken my own life and God has put it back together? That, that compels me to want to be holy. Have you ever been in a house where it's just lamps, no electricity? In Peru, in the jungle, that's what we had. And we would have lamps. And if that oil ever runs out of that lamp and that wick begins to burn, my dear friend, when that wick begins to consume, it will smell horribly. It begins to burn because there's no longer any oil. And it stinks. And what you do is you just take the thing, open up the window and throw it outside. It stunk up the whole house. A thing that was supposed to give light has done nothing but stink up everything. But when Christ begins to work with a believer and fills them with the oil of His Spirit and they grieve the Holy Spirit through sin, and the wick begins to burn and the Christian begins to stink and it's nothing but the smell of burning flesh, Christ doesn't take that, throw it out the window and say, well, I can get another lamp. But He begins again pruning and cleaning and preparing and then filling once again. What is the motivation for being holy? The way God sees you in Christ. He says, thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. It's talking about when you look at me, literally, my heart beats faster when you look at me. Is this true? 
Does it really mean that every time I give a heavenly glance, every time I look towards my Father in heaven, His heart beats faster? Do you see that? Does that not excite you? Does that not encourage you to pray? Does that not encourage you to keep your eyes on Him? That every time I look to the Father, His heart is ravished. Every time I look, my little boy, when I get home, I just look and when he peeks around that door and looks at me, I am just on fire. You see, you think most of the time you go to God and he's like, just, well, I gotta listen to him. That's the covenant. I gotta stay here. If you're a believer, every time you turn your eyes upward in prayer, the Father's heart beats faster. He is so full of divine joy. He so awaits your glance. That makes me want to just stop preaching right now and go pray. And then he says this, look what he says. He says, ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck, with a necklace, literally. I'm mesmerized by the beauty of that necklace you have on. And what would that be? But grace? What would that be? The very gifts. He says, the very gifts I gave you when I see them, they ravish my heart. Oh, my dear friend, if you could own, I don't know if you're, if you're even, you might just totally disagree with me on this. I don't know, but if you could only see what I'm saying here, that when you bow your knee to prayer, when you bow your knee to pray, when you look up, when you're walking down the street, when you're in Walmart, wherever, and you give that upward glance, Father, it ravishes his heart. And when he looks down at you, he sees only that which he has given you. Grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy. Don't you want to be holy? Don't you want to pray? If things are such as the Bible says, doesn't that change everything? What is the motivation, is the motivation for being holy?